1953, the explosion of the hydrogen bomb transforms the Soviet Union into a superpower. Andrei Sakharov, inventor of the most lethal weapon on Earth, is considered a hero and savior of his country. Yet, 20 years later, the West honors him with the Nobel Peace Prize. Sakharov's courage and iron resolve will lead him from scientist to activist during the turbulent times of the Soviet Union. Andrei Sakharov is born in Moscow, May 21st, 1921, to a family of Russian intelligentsia. His father, Dmitry, teaches physics at a private school, and his mother, Ekaterina, is raised by a Russian general. By 1917, Ekaterina and Dmitry fall in love during the social upheaval of the Russian Revolution. When Andrei turns eight, his country is ruled by Joseph Stalin. Stalin proves to be the most brutal dictator of the 20th century. Millions of Soviet citizens are murdered or sent to prison camps during his 30-year reign of terror. I grew up in an era marked by tragedy, cruelty, and terror. I begin to hear the words arrest and search more and more often. Hardly a single family remained untouched. I hardly ever heard my father condemn the regime outright, but there was one occasion when he denounced Stalin with such vehemence that mother feared for his life. Protected by his family against communist propaganda, Andrei is homeschooled by tutors and his father until the seventh grade. Sakharov adored his father. He was largely schooled at home, perhaps to keep him away from Soviet indoctrination and poor quality schools. But it also retarded his socialization so that he was always at sort of awkward with people, especially when he finally did go to school. He didn't make friends with the boys. He was absolutely f terrified of the girls. When Andre enters university at age 17, he shows signs of brilliance in the area of physics. But his education is suddenly interrupted. June 22, 1941, the German army invades Russia. Russia is nearly defeated before joining with the Allies. With Russia at war, Sakharov is assigned to work in a laboratory hundreds of miles from home. It is there that he meets and marries Claudia Vikhirova, a laboratory technician, in 1943. In 1945, age 23, Sakharov returns to Moscow and enters Fian for graduate work in physics. The same year, World War II comes to a shattering end. On my way to the bakery on the morning of August 7, 1945, I stopped to glance at the newspaper and discovered President Truman's announcement. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. Thousands are killed. The landscape devastated by the dropping of an atom bomb. An iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central 
and Eastern Europe. The wartime alliance between allies turns cold. America and Russia now view each other with fear and distrust. If the Americans use the bomb once, they could use it again. The information that the Americans have uh, a new powerful weapon, the weapon of mass destruction, provoked them immediately to develop the same thing because otherwise somebody will be stronger than they are. At age 25, Sakharov is recruited to create a hydrogen bomb for the Soviet Union, a bomb far more destructive than the atom bomb. He joins the elite scientists of the Soviet Union at a remote location called the Installation. Sakharov invents a radically new design called the Sloika. У папы было очень оригинальное uh, мышление, никому не свойственное только ему, и он мог найти очень точный, неординарный ответ на очень многие задачи. March 5, 1953, Stalin dies. For Soviet citizens, it is a time of fear and mixed emotions with the election of a new Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev was, a, was actually a fairly good human being. Not to say that he wasn't up to his elbows in blood, as, as the saying goes, but still he had maintained a certain humanity. And he was genuinely shocked by some of the crimes of Stalin when he, when he learned about them. And he really did not want them repeated. And he, he believed in, in, in justice and, and in freeing the innocent from the camps. He opened the camp gates, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people returned from the camps. There was a feeling of, um, it was called the thaw, which meaning just after a terrible winter, the, the ice was melting, you could, you could breathe again. The race for the bomb continues. Khrushchev is committed to making the Soviet Union a superpower. On August 12, 1953, the Sloika explodes over the test site. I understood, of course, the terrifying, inhuman nature of the weapons we were building. The recent war had also been an exercise in barbarity, and although I hadn't fought in that conflict, I regarded myself as a soldier in this new scientific war. At a very young age, he successfully delivered the H-bomb to the Soviet Union. They had a couple of A-bombs, and they had a big army. They were, but they really weren't a superpower until they had the H-bomb, and Sakharov gave them the H-bomb. Sakharov made them a superpower. With the second successful test in 1955, Sakharov's euphoria is short-lived. He learns that the explosion caused two deaths. A trench collapsed on a young soldier, and a two-year-old girl perished in a bomb shelter. Sakharov grows troubled by his invention. We, the inventors, had created a terrible weapon, the most terrible weapon in human history, but its use would lie entirely outside of our control. The ideas and emotions kindled at that moment have not diminished to this day, and they completely altered my thinking. Sakharov foresees the deadly reality of the tests. He calculates that thousands of future deaths will be caused by radioactive debris in the atmosphere. Вот на базе того, что он стал отцом вот водородной бомбы, у него вот он и начал сомневаться вот в разумности того, чего он, что он делает, то есть делает и вот какой-то, на мой взгляд, 
произошел психологический переворот. От смертоносности, чем он занимался, к животворности. The inventor of the H-bomb now fights with equal tenacity to have testing banned above ground, sea and outer space. Led by the efforts of Andrei Sakharov, the Moscow Limited Test Ban Treaty is formally signed by the United States and the Soviet Union in 1963. Testing is to be conducted underground, where radiation debris is limited. The reserved scientist Andrei Sakharov is becoming an activist. В моей стране эйфория бывает периодически. Каждый раз то, что называется народом или большинством его, ощущало некий подъем и такое переживание надежды, что больше так не будет. Это было в 1945 году, это было при Хрущеве, это было в 1991 году. И потом каждый раз мы, россияне, всенародно оказывались все в том же, я сейчас скажу очень грубое слово, дерьме. In 1964 Khrushchev is replaced by Leonid Brezhnev. A ruthless leader, Brezhnev has no tolerance for defiance and clamps down on Soviet society. But the country has changed. After tasting reform, there are those who refuse to return to the days of Stalin. These people are known as the Soviet dissidents. The dissidents had no desire for power. Their initial goals were very modest. Let's just enforce the laws of the Soviet Constitution. This Constitution guaranteed Soviet citizens the freedom of assembly, the freedom of speech, and never, never implemented in the country. Dissidents made a very simple thing. They lived as free people. They became free people in a free country. Andrei Sinyavsky and Yuli Daniel, both writers of fiction, are illegally arrested for writing fiction manuscripts and sending them abroad under pen names. Their trial is a turning point in the consciousness of the dissident movement. There were several key moments in the history of what had become a kind of Soviet-style intelligentsia uh, that were key. There was a trial of Sinyovsky and Daniel, two very important writers. Uh, this was used as a kind of signal that what had gone under Khrushchev would not happen under Brezhnev. Их произведения не были антисоветскими. Они были просто независимыми. Я говорю, что их произведения никакой опасности реальной для государства не представляли. Не произведения, а они сами, Синявский и Даниэль, как проявление независимости и свободы государству казались опасными. Сегодня Синявский и Даниэль пишут, а завтра еще пять человек будут писать, а послезавтра 50 и 500. Two dissidents, Alexander Ginsburg and Yuri Galanskov, are arrested for attending the trial, legal under the Soviet Constitution. Sakharov decides to act. He signs a letter to Brezhnev in defense of Ginsburg and Galanskov and removes his hat in Pushkin Square to protest the treatment of Soviet dissidents. His actions catch the eye of the KGB. 
KGB report on Andrei Sakharov. Sakharov born in Moscow, not a party member, is one of the creators of the Fatherland thermonuclear weapon. Certain hostile elements are continuing their efforts to exploit the name of the well-known scientist, academician Sakharov, by systematically asking him to endorse documents of political harmful content. Sakharov's next action shocks the Politburo and intensifies his surveillance by the KGB. By the beginning of 1968, I felt a growing compulsion to speak on our fundamental issues of our age. My readings and my discussions had acquainted me with the notions of an open society, convergence and world government. In 1968, I took my decisive step by publishing Reflections on Progress, Peaceful Coexistence, and Intellectual Freedom. It was unheard of to, uh, for a Soviet scientist to speak out on such a range of subjects so freely. No one had the slightest idea of even who these people were, let alone what they thought, because it was still such a closed and secret society. On a single day, July 22, 1968, Andrei Sakharov skyrockets to fame when his smuggled essay appears in the New York Times and on international radio. Когда я услышала по радио Свободы, я даже была настолько наивной, что я не понимала, что такое, что если советский человек отправляет свои какие-то материалы на международные радиостанции, что это может быть значит. Значит, мой муж, который был чуть-чуть старше меня на пару лет, и он не был таким наивным, как я, и он сказал, послушай, твой папа станет либо очень неизвестным, либо очень гонимым. Пророчески он сказал, на самом деле получилось и то, и другое. We believe that in order to receive timely information on Sakharov's intentions and to discover contact inciting him to commit hostile acts, it is essential to install listening devices in Sakharov's apartment. Присутствие КГБ родители стали ощущать не только, э, не только в присутствии секретарей, но в присутствии в проверках дома. Э, в наше отсутствие папа замечал, что его книги э, и какие-то его несекретные бумаги э, лежат на полках в других местах. А однажды, когда мы приехали в московскую квартиру с объекта, Папа и мама увидели на блюдечке окурок сигареты. Soon after the publication of Reflections, Sakharov's life takes a drastic turn. He is fired from the installation and ordered never to return. The great scientist and hero of the Soviet Union is left unemployed at age 47. In August 1968, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia ends what is known as the Prague Spring. The Prague Spring was, in a sense, an attempt by the Czechoslovakian Communist Party to establish what was called socialism with a human face. The Soviet Union was increasingly nervous that it was going to lose its grip on Eastern Europe. And so in August 1968, the Soviet army invaded Czechoslovakia and crushed the Prague Spring. We experienced euphoria, 
эйфории мы испытывали глубочайшее, даже трагическое разочарование. Our hopes, inspired by the Prague Spring, collapsed, and real socialism displayed its true colors. For millions of former supporters, it destroyed their faith in the Soviet system and its potential for reform. In 1969, Sakharov's wife Claudia dies of cancer. He is alone and devastated. But growing disillusionment with Soviet policy propels Sakharov forward. At age 49, he joins the Human Rights Committee, an organization whose goal is to study and report on human rights violations in the Soviet Union. It is at the home of dissident Valery Chalitza that Sakharov first meets Eliana Bonner. Once I arrived, Shalidza was reclining on his sofa, talking to a beautiful woman. I was impressed by her serious, energetic, and business-like manner. After she left, Shalidza announced with a certain pride, that was Eliana Bonner. She's been helping prisoners nearly all her life. Я не могу спать, когда человека, которого я знаю, приговаривают к смертной казни. Я не могу спать, когда человек, которого я знаю, отправляют в психушку. И мой отклик очень конкретный. Андрей и Алиана grow closer, joined together by their mutual passion for human rights and a growing love for one another. On January 7th, 1972, Sakharov and Bonner register their marriage. I think that our союз is banal, banal, our mutual love. They um, had the saying between them that we have to, uh, every year counts for three. Because, uh, well, first of all, because they felt I think, this is my interpretation, that uh, they found each other at last. And they didn't know how much time they would have left. And they met pretty late in, in life. So um, that's why they felt that they have to make every year count for three. Their honeymoon is spent on a plane to Kiev, supporting another dissident on trial. There was perhaps something symbolic about our beginning, our official married life. For many years to come, hundreds of similar errands would oblige us to rush off somewhere, to sit up typing till four in the morning, to argue with some official until we became hoarse. Он охотно рассказывал, когда его спрашивали о положении дел и о том, как он пытается помочь людям, попавшим а, в беду, причем не за преступление, а за то, что он сказал то, что думает, или у него дома нашли запрещенную книжку, он в защиту таких людей всегда выступал. Теперь известно больше 300 его заявлений в защиту таких людей. Ко многим он на суд ездил, старался выступить в суде, но, как правило, в зал суда его не пропускали, он терпеливо стоял на улице и ждал, пока выйдет этот человек. Their kitchen becomes a place of gathering for dissidents to talk about reforms and enjoy cabbage soup before being rounded up and imprisoned. To the success of our hopeless cause, their nightly toast. It was more like a party, it a kitchen party, if you can say that, where a few people, maybe a dozen, would, sit, would be around the table and speak about the problems of the country, the arrests, the interrogation, the persecution. The year of 1972 results in a wave of arrests, 
many of the dissidents who gather around Sakharov's kitchen table slowly disappear. In the late 1960s, the Soviet leaders began seeking detente with the United States. The dissidents know that their leaders cannot be trusted. In June 1974, during Richard Nixon's visit to Moscow, Sakharov stages the first of many hunger strikes. The West was playing a dangerous game by accepting the taunt without insisting on a concurrent democratization of Soviet society. A country that does not respect its own constitution can hardly be expected to respect any other agreement except those that serve its own self-interest. The regime labels Sakharov a traitor and encourages their citizens to do the same. Hundreds of letters pour in denouncing Sakharov, but the most wounding is a letter signed by 40 academicians calling Sakharov a traitor. I считаю, что мое главное в этой жизни защищенно вырастить свою дочку максимально защищенно. То есть, если ей в школе объясняют и она читает, что вот ее дедушка предал родину. И я должна объяснить дочери, где же, собственно говоря, правда, то я объясняла ей, что, конечно, дедушка никакой не предатель, а, естественно, дедушка понимает просто вперед нашей системы, и поэтому вот наша система так жестоко с ним эм, обращается. Я прошу вас, Ельену Сахарову, Боннер, получать... The West does not agree and awards Andrei Dmitrievich Sakharov their highest honor. In 1975, at age 54, Andrei Sakharov becomes the first Soviet citizen to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Eliana Bonner flies to Norway to represent her husband, as Sakharov is denied permission to attend. On the day that Sakharov was to receive the Nobel Prize, he is attending the trial of his close friend, Sergei Kovalov. Physically, Andrei Dmitrievich присутствовал в вестибюле суда, а в зале я его не видел. Его не пустили. Я только слышал его голос, который повторял, я академик Сахаров, здесь судят моего друга, у меня есть важные свидетельские показания, я требую, чтобы меня пропустили в зал. He is staying in front of the courthouse where he is not allowed to get in. And inside the courthouse you have his closest friend who stands trial for anti-Soviet agitation and, and propaganda. Andrei Dmitrievich, every arrest, experienced as his own pain. I very little knew people которые так остро реагировали бы на, на, на чужие несчастья. И, и, знаете, это редкостный дар, так сказать, своей кожей ощущать чужую боль. Самый факт присуждения международной премии человеку, выступающими за гражданские и политические права против произвола и беззакония, является утверждением тех принципов, которые играют такую важную роль в определении будущего человечества. It was 
You're very good, actually. You, you felt that there is other life, not just, the, not just the trials. There was another life. The free people you know, were able to express their feelings. Sakharov, he was on their minds, but he wasn't alone. All of us, for whom the trumpets, the, the sounds, the sound of the trumpets were for, for all of us. In December 1979, Russia invades Afghanistan. Sakharov views the invasion as expansionism and openly speaks against it. He has gone too far. Sakharov's interference has to be silenced. January 22, 1980, I was detained on the streets and taken by special force to the USSR Procurator's Office. I was informed that a decree of the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet had deprived me of the title Hero of the Socialist Labor and other decorations and awards. I was taken that day on a special flight to Gorky, together with my wife, Eliana Bonner, who was allowed to accompany me. Andre and Eliana are exiled to the closed city of Gorky. They are under constant surveillance by the secret police. There is an officer posted at their door and others following them wherever they go. Andre and Eliana are cut off from the world and the people they love. I have a, I have a short stand, stand when we make, yes, sure. Thank you. Soon uh, after we got to Gorky, we heard Tanya on a broadcast from America appealing on my behalf. Her voice sounded so close, so warm and vibrant that our eyes filled with tears. Political crimes. Let us not forget that the Soviet Union is not only the country of Mr. Andropov, but also of Andrei Sakharov. The West has not forgotten them. Eliana's children who had immigrated to America now fight to secure their parents' freedom. We were very concerned for their lives in Moscow, and we tried to maintain contact. It was tremendously difficult. and. Uh, uh, we would try to publicize it as, as wide as we could. There were times when we, in our room we had up to 20 journalists from all over the, 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 the place. The press was crucial in spreading the word. If you listen to me, I am not going to sit here and argue with you. Just, just put me through to work. Eliana's health is failing. She needs medical attention outside the Soviet Union. The party refuses. Sakharov starts a hunger strike, demanding that his wife be released for treatment abroad. The party will not give in. But to prevent Sakharov from dying, the KGB comes up with an ominous solution. They took me by force to Gorky Regional Hospital. I was subjected to the excruciating and degradating process of force feeding. A tight clamp was placed on my nose, so I could breathe only through my mouth. Whenever I opened my mouth to take a breath, a spoonful of nutriment would be poured into my mouth. I experienced a continuing feeling of suffocation. Their separation will last over a hundred days. Twice he was forced to give up his hunger strike. But Sakharov's will is unbreakable. His third strike leads to victory and Eliana's release for treatment abroad. What 
психологическое ощущение трагичности, счастливой, счастливого времени и каждый раз ощущение победы. В общем, мы вдвоем, два немолодых и больных человека, каждый раз одерживали победу над этим самым мощным в военном смысле тоталитарным государством. For Sakharov, the dark clouds begin to lift after Mikhail Gorbachev is elected general secretary of the Communist Party in 1985. Under Gorbachev, the Soviet Union undergoes an enormous transformation called perestroika. Freedom is in the air as reforms shape the nation. Some of the West's lingering suspicions are dispelled in early December when a charismatic Gorbachev addresses the United Nations and calls for an end to the Cold War. Today I can report to you that the Soviet Union has taken a decision to reduce its armed forces. Within the next two years, their numerical strength will be reduced by 500,000 men. The numbers of conventional armaments will also be substantially reduced. Было бы странно, если бы мы э, здесь взяли курс на гласность и свободу, творчество, а Сахарова бы держали э, в Горьком. Two electricians, escorted by a KGB agent, entered the apartment. They had orders to install a phone. The KGB man warned us, you'll get a call around 10 tomorrow morning. Я поздоровался с ним, вот, и сказал, я хочу вам сказать, что вы можете возвращаться в Москву, в свою квартиру и в академию. Такое наше мнение, такое решение Политбюро. Thank you. But I must tell you that a few days ago my friend Marchenka was killed in prison. He was the first person I mentioned in my letter to you, requesting the release of prisoners of conscience, people persecuted for their beliefs. Я еще не договорил, как он, боясь, что я сейчас положу трубку, сказав ему, что он может возвращаться на этом, закончится разговор, он говорит, Михаил Сергеевич, я пользуюсь тем, чтобы с вами разговаривать, я требую, чтобы все политически политически заключенные узники там совести были выпущены everyone sentenced under those articles has been sentenced illegally unjustly and they ought to be freed Андрей Дмитриевич или мы все это рассмотрим но сейчас я хотел главное сказать что вы возвращаетесь Вот. И включайтесь во все, во все наши перемены, во все дела. Seven years of exile ends as dramatically as it began. On Monday, December 23, 1986, Eliana and Andre step off the train into a transformed and vibrant Russia. Товарищ Мишалкин сейчас вот поднимал товарищ Попов, Гавриил Харитонович. For the first time in 70 years, semi-free elections are called. Gorbachev allows some of the candidates to be elected by the people. Under Mikhail Gorbachev, there is the first free election of deputies to the Soviet Congress. At age 67, Sakharov continues to fight, now as a member of the All-Union Congress of People's Deputies. Исключение. 
Sakharov demands democratic changes more radical than the Communist Party's official line of modest reforms. He wants a repeal of Article 6, which grants a monopoly of power to the Communist Party. For true democracy, multi-party elections must take place. Он все-таки ходил к Горбачеву. И он беседовал с ним, и он ему пытался э, рассказать о, о том, в чем Горбачев ведет себя непоследовательно. И я однажды вот так сижу, работаю в кабинете, весь уже зал выключен. Я выхожу и вдруг вижу в тени сидит Сахаров. Я удивился, я не знал, что он здесь. А я вышел, сел всем с ним рядом, так и в полутемноте, в полумраке сидим. Mikhail Sergeyevich, the country and you personally are at the crossroads. Either accelerate the process of change to the maximum or try to retain the administrative command system in all of its aspects. In the first case, you will have to rely on the left and you'll be able to count on the support of many brave and energetic people. In the second case, you know yourself whose support you will have. But they will never forgive you for backing Pierestroika. Такая вот нечеловеческая энергия и активность она не от здоровья, а от характера Сахарова. То есть от силы воли, от способности сосредоточиться, выложить всего себя для достижения какой-то цели. Сон по нескольку часов в сутки. И потом постоянная активность, физическая, интеллектуальная. Не по возрасту. Напряжение не по возрасту. Вот, вот примерно. А, то есть он э, горел просто-напросто. И не обращал он внимания на свое здоровье. On December 14th, 1989, Sakharov gives the last of his memoirs to his wife with an inscribed dedication. The main thing is that my beloved and I are united. I have dedicated this book to her. Life goes on. We are together. That evening at age 68, Andrei Sakharov dies of heart failure. You see, couple of hundreds of thousands of people who come to the funeral and, and you know they 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 do do of Sakharov and they wanted him to succeed they, they wanted the perestroika they are for change but still you can't help but ask where were you all these years Когда-то была придумана такая русская поговорка «Не стоит село без праведника». Я должен сказать, что это был человек, на которого я опирался. Я 
Ни я никому не говорил, ни ему в том числе. Но и он опирался на Горбачева. In 1990, Article 6 is revoked and presidential elections replace the communist hold. The torch of freedom and democracy is now carried on by others. Sakharov's vision for the people he fought for and the Russia he loved is changing the conscience of his country. My fate was in a sense exceptional. It is not false modesty, but the desire to be precise that prompts me to say that my fate proved greater than my personality. I only tried to keep up with it.